Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Myself and a bunch of other rocket nerds stayed up late last night to watch what promised to be a spectacular launch of a Delta IV Heavy. Delta IV's heavies are always very special because they launch in a massive fireball due to the way their engines start up. So yeah, uh, this mission was delayed from earlier in the week, and it was also delayed and pushed back inside its own launch window. But eventually, all the holds were released, everyone was pulled, they will go for launch, they counted down, the engines started to light, we got a massive fireball, they called out liftoff, and the rocket stayed sitting on the pad. The systems had automatically aborted the launch three seconds before liftoff. And that's kind of embarrassing, but hey, at least we got a giant fireball out of it. So yeah, we're it's probably going to be a week while they reset this. Once they, you know, once they do have a, a startup like that, they have to light things like the radially outward firing igniters. That's the spark generators. Once those are lit, they have to physically replace those things. So it, it pushes back their um, their next possible launch window. So yeah, um, that's rather embarrassing. But, um, you know, the Delta IV is becoming something of a temperamental old beast, or beast in its old age. It's uh, The last Delta IV heavy launch attempt was from Vandenberg, and it too had a ground service equipment problem 7.5 seconds before launch. Uh, there's only like four other Delta IV launches after this one in the next couple of years. It's a, you know, wonderful rocket in many, many ways, but it is kind of expensive. So anyway, yeah, according to Tori Bruno, this problem was related to ground service equipment. Uh, and I, yeah, I expect that it will fly in the next week. Um, we, do, we don't know what the payload is. It's called NROL44, which is, of course, super secret, but we can make some speculations later. One thing we do know is that this will push one of SpaceX's launches back. So they were planning to launch a spacecraft called SAOCOM which was going to go into a polar orbit. And it was going to be the first polar orbit from Florida in a very, very long time, like 50 years. The last time this happened, uh, a Thor rocket launched a payload and uh, the booster landed on Cuba and supposedly caused a small amount of uh, international tension after it killed a cow. So uh, SpaceX is uh, going to test this. They're going to perform what basically you head out slightly southeast around Miami and then you perform a dog leg maneuver to enter proper polar orbit. So it's kind of like a drift turn, but in a rocket. That's sure to be good, but that's definitely getting pushed back. But I think we are going to have a Starlink launch on uh, Sunday regardless. So yeah, um, yeah, Delta IV, it's, it's a it is unfortunate. Yeah, they have this last minute abort and it's not the most last minute abort I've ever seen. I've seen, uh, if you remember STS-68, I believe, Space Shuttle, they were, they had lit the engines on the Space Shuttle. They were, you are know, ramping them up to power and then it was shut down at 1.8 seconds before T equals zero. So it's not the latest launch abort I've ever seen by any means. But we, we don't really know what happened here. When when they start up the Delta IV, they have, they have to be very careful uh, because the engines are running on hydrogen and oxygen and they run very hydrogen rich. And this is to get better thrust, but also when you run hydrogen rich, the flame is cooler and it doesn't have any oxidizer in it. So that's much more, it's a much safer environment. They can't ever allow the mixture to become oxygen rich inside the RS-68A engines. So 5.5 seconds before ignition, they open the valves to the gas generator, right, which runs the per turbo pumps, and uh, they spin the turbines up with he compressed helium. So they have a fuel-rich burner there that starts driving the pumps, and they open the hydrogen valve to the main engine, and that starts blowing hydrogen through it, and then Two seconds before proper ignition, they have they open the oxygen valve. And it sounds like they didn't get to the oxygen valve opening because we just got fire. We didn't really get any thrust. Uh, also on the Delta IV Heavy, because they blow so much hydrogen out of the bottom and they make this fireball, they have this process where the starboard engine is lit two seconds before the other two so that when it comes up to thrust, it creates like a Venturi effect that sucks the excess hydrogen down underneath the pad and it burns up there where it's less of a problem that doesn't burn the sides of the rocket as much. 
So yeah, there's only like four more Delta Four launches after this. Um, it's uh, going to be interesting. Yeah, it's going to be sad to see this thing go. It, it they they are going to launch up until 2023, I believe, all with classified military payloads. Two will be from Florida. Two will be from Vandenberg. But you know, it, it's interesting because earlier in this month we actually had the results of the sort of next generation launch services agreement program. So the Delta Four actually it came out from the in the 1990s from the Evolved Expendable Launch Vehicle Program. That was alongside the Atlas V. And back then the Delta IV and the Atlas V were both by separate companies. And of course, they only merged in the early 2000s into a single you know, United Launch Alliance entity. And now, of course, you have many more rocket companies. There's a competitive bidding process going ahead. And in the last few years, we've had Northrop Grumman bidding Omega. Uh, there's Blue Origin bidding with uh, New Glenn. Uh, ULA was bidding with Vulcan. And of course, SpaceX had Falcon Heavy. And, you know, they actually, a few years ago, Omega, New Glenn, and Vulcan all got money from this program to develop their vehicles. SpaceX never got anything because Falcon Heavy was pretty much already demonstrated. And earlier this month, they actually announced who was getting the contracts, and it's basically 60% ULA for Vulcan and 40% SpaceX uh, for Falcon Heavy. That means Blue Origin doesn't get anything, Northrop Grumman doesn't get anything, Omega is probably never going to fly, and to be honest, it was just a bunch of solid rocket motors bolted together to try to pretend that they had a real rocket. But yeah, it, it's it, I don't see it flying, I don't see a customer coming in for it. But, you know, Blue Origin is providing the engine for Vulcan and Northrop Grumman are making the strap-on boosters. So I guess they are sort of involved in the ULA deal regardless. It's also worth noting that one of the Falcon heavy contracts is going to be a $316 million launch in 2022. And that is spectacularly large. Like NASA is flying a payload to an asteroid on a Falcon heavy and they're going to pay $117 million. Why is you know, US government Department of Defense paying 300 million. And I suspect it's because this is going to require significant changes to Falcon Heavy's ground infrastructure. Because a lot of NRO payloads require vertical integration. That means they can't put the rocket on the side with the payload on it like most uh, SpaceX payloads. They have to have the rocket in the vertical position and then they have to put the payload on it and they might have to keep it there for a long time. So I suspect that this includes new facilities so they can do the vertical integration and probably a longer fairing which will need its own testing. Uh, what that payload is, we're not sure. Why does it need to be kept vertical? That's a very good question. These things are highly classified and to be honest, it might be that the original classification that says they need you know, vertical integration is so classified that nobody has bothered to ask, do we really need to keep it vertical anymore? You know, classification is weird like that. But as for, yeah, that classified payload. So there's, there's a couple of clues that lead us to believe that this is an Orion Signals Intelligence satellite. So the patch includes references to the Five Eyes organization, which is a number of nations around the world, like U USA, Canada, the UK, Australia, and I think New Zealand, maybe I've got that wrong. But they basically work together to downlink signals intelligence data from US satellites that are in geostationary orbit. When the, the of course, NRO 44 launch, the orbit is classified and indeed once they get to the second stage deployment and the, and the fairings come off like the webcast will end and no one will know where it goes but they do have to notify airmen and mariners where the stages will be coming down and so based upon these notifications that talk about the splash zones we know that it's heading directly east into an eastwards orbit which is consistent with going into geostationary orbit so it'll launch, go eastwards, shut down its second stage engine, and then once it reaches the equator, it'll perform a second firing of the engine to bring it into a geostationary transfer orbit. And with the Delta IV, it actually can relight that second stage a third time to perform the proper geostationary orbit insertion. And this is, of course, very popular with people that like to have as much propellant on board their spacecraft. This is 
able to put a six ton payload into geostationary orbit, which we believe is consistent with the mass of an Orion or at least a current generation Orion spacecraft. So these Orion Signals Intelligence spacecraft, they are, well, they're monsters. They're like five to six tons and they unfurl antenna, which are folded up inside that fairing. The antenna is believed to be 100 meters across, right? 330 feet for those people that don't speak metric. And these sit up there, they point down at the ground and they get the angular resolution where they can find individual sources, localize them and read out you know, different areas, different frequencies. These are actually derived from a, 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 well, a project in the 1960s, which was codenamed Rhyolite. And the idea back then was to specifically listen to Soviet missile tests, to listen to the telemetry from the rockets. So they launched these in the early 1960s and yeah, they would literally get the telemetry, which was just being broadcast in all directions and from geostationary orbit. And they would be able to reconstruct the performance of the launch vehicles, of the missiles or whatever. But having such a large antenna, they were of course able to do other things and evolved over time to involve more agencies. In the 1980s, the Orion it was the design that came and that was originally launched in the space shuttle. There were two of these. The space shuttle launched them using something called the inertial upper stage, which is a two-stage solid rocket motor. Um, later on, as the space shuttle stopped carrying these payloads, they moved them over to Titan IVs and then they moved them to Delta IVs, the Delta IV heavies. And so there's a bunch of these sitting up here, all listening to things on the ground. There's a photo out there that shows one of these satellites sitting next to a geostationary communication satellite that sits over the Middle East. I don't know how encrypted that traffic is or what they're listening in on, but yeah, it's kind of, it's obviously a fascinating program, but uh, it's obviously very, very classified. I mean, even the Rhyolite stuff is still very, very classified. There's one picture and that's heavily redacted and it's an artist's impression. Like unlike Corona, the imagery from Corona had obvious scientific uses because it was you know, mapping the world and showing uh, ground information. Signals intelligence stuff from the 1960s, there's no, you know, non, there's no civilian use for that. So I don't think that's getting declassified anytime soon. So yeah, hopefully we'll see this launch later, you know, perhaps next week, and it will be spectacular. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.